New York Times with Uju Anya, who, if you look on Twitter, has 50,000 followers, so you can add to that number. And um, very, very, very active and looking forward to her talk tomorrow. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I'm very, very happy to talk about Maria Polinsky's third and very important lecture tonight. And I'm very gratified because uh, Masha, if I may use the hypocoristic, and I share many things, including having overlapped as colleagues at Harvard University for a few glorious years, uh, overlapped in San Diego geographically uh, a number of times. And of course, more importantly than those contingencies of history, uh, overlapped a lot in our research histories and intellectual and I would even say ethical commitments to minoritized languages. Professor Polinsky has a very uh, important uh, effort in what's called field stations. Field stations are a way of doing field work in an integrated manner with local communities. And there is one in Guatemala that you can actually read about in the pages of Language, the Journal of the Linguistic Society of America from 2019. And there is also one, as I understand, in the Caucasus, very much within the Kibrik tradition that many of you may know about in, the, um, in, 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 in Russia and the former Soviet Union of doing very uh, integrated field work. And uh, also of great intellectual resonance is the fact that Professor Polinsky works with uh, what are called heritage languages. Heritage languages are in a way deeply connected to minoritized languages because a uh, heritage language and a minoritized language, I would say both share in common kind of the fact that they are products of almost asymmetric bilingualism, right? So a minoritized language is one that uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the language itself uh, are spoken uh, in contexts uh, alongside a more dominant language. And that also happens with heritage languages. So many heritage languages end up being minoritized and vice versa. Today, interestingly, uh, we're going to hear not about heritage languages and not specifically about the field station uh, efforts, but I would encourage you to you know, look at, at, at well, you know, every talk you can think is a sort of hyperlink that in Bergsonian Nabokovian time, you can click on and find all kinds of other directions. But um, in fact, today is going to be about um, an important lesson that John Balin's question at the end of my first lecture brought up, namely, is all data from minoritized languages you know, immediately transformative of linguistic theory? And I think the answer there is, well, proceed with caution, right? You need to integrate um, with existing theoretical models, you, you know, pure um, nihilism or pure um, sort of uh, otherness of data from an unfamiliar language isn't necessarily the right way to build theoretical bridges. And so we're going to hear a very unique lesson about that today as it relates to the question of gender and noun classes. Uh, this is, in a way, let's say maybe tangentially peripherally connected to chapters, um, to chapter three of my book, which is related to uh, the understanding of noun classes in Southern Bantu in closest conjunct agreement in a way that makes them look quite a bit like gender systems as we may know from uh, Indo-European languages, but of course, very, let's say non-binary genders. You'd have to have eight gender systems in those languages and not necessarily based on masculine and feminine, but all kinds of other semantic divisions. And I think with that, you might say, what kind of semantic divisions or are they even semantic divisions is exactly where we'll turn uh, with Masha's lecture. So Masha, please take it away. Um, thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> and um, many thanks for inviting me to be part of this series. Um, I was actually going to talk a little bit about the field station um, as the introduction and Andrew already mentioned some of that. So one of the lessons we learned from um, the lectures we've already seen is that our theories can get much better, much richer if we do careful work on lesser known languages, which are minoritized, often endangered, often unwritten, often heritage. And work on those languages creates a sense of social commitment where linguists are not just uh, researchers and scholars, but also um, 
social agents. And I want to emphasize that a social commitment is a two-way street where linguists contribute to research on minoritized languages and therefore engage with language communities. And the communities gain from that because they get the sense of ownership and purpose. And so the two groups have to engage in meaningful interactions. And one way of building such meaningful interactions is um, in this concept of the field station that Andrew mentioned. Essentially, a field station is an established infrastructure on site, in location. And on this map, you see the field station in Patsun, Guatemala. And some of the people who are in the audience today actually have visited the field station in pre-COVID times. And the main components behind this concept are the sense of trust, the sense of access, which is access to resources for both sides, and the sense of responsibility. The choice of Guatemala was not accidental. We were able to uh, engage with the local people because there is a strong element of indigenous activism in Guatemala. And so we were welcome there, which is not always the case, but that's a very important part. And so just a little bit about the field station. Um, you can see what the field station does, clicking on the link, which I posted here. But I just want to give you a brief overview of the philosophy behind that. And the main idea is that, that it's hard to engage with the community without being in the community. And when you want to build trust with speakers of minoritized languages, you're in for a long haul. So it's a long-term process and a long-term presence is important. It's also important not to be very selfish and self-centered and remember that we're just one prong in a multi-prong effort of sustaining minoritized communities. And so the more we engage with other scholars or activists, the better. And then finally, physical presence in the minoritized community is a very important resource, uh, source of revenue stream, of educational opportunity. It's something that allows the locals to integrate in the scientific endeavors. And the field station in Guatemala, we've been able to train a number of native speaker linguists by now over a dozen. Um, and these are people who've been trained in language documentation, language annotation. A lot of people have taken our workshops on ELAN, um, on language data collection, child language acquisition. Guatemala is home to quite a few indigenous languages and we've been able to train speakers of several of such languages. So this is just an example of social commitment and the way the social commitment can be implemented. And of course, social commitment brings responsibility. And the responsibility includes the ecological validity and the analytical integrity of the work we do. The ecological validity essentially means that we want to make sure that the data we collect um, would be accurate, complete, and importantly replicable. And then analytical integrity implies that we want to use new languages to inform our theories and also use our theories to better understand new languages. And as we strain, uh, strive for ecological validity, um, we want to assess the source of information. We want to get our facts straight want to build comprehensive descriptions. And analytic integrity implies that we don't want to overly exoticize the language we work with. And we don't want to abuse the data we find in order to leverage our favorite theoretical predictions. So theory gives us power to handle complex data, make clear predictions about them, and discover or rediscover generalizations. We saw it in Johnson's lecture last week that the rediscovery of some generalizations is quite important as we work on new minoritized languages. So I wanna go um, now to a famous or a notorious example, depending on how you look at that. It's a well-known paper by Jeff Pullum about the multiple words for snow and Eskimo. And so Pullum, who is a fantastic writer says, never does a month go by without yet another publication of the familiar claim about the wondrous richness of the Eskimo conceptual scheme. Hundreds of words for different grades and types of snow. Alaska graphical winter wonderland, the quintessential demonstration of how primitive minds character categorize the world so differently from us. And then he goes on to basically takes this claim to shreds and um, cites a very old and very accurate dictionary of West Greenlandic 
where there are just two possible relevant roots, kanik, which means snow in the air, and aput, which means snow on the ground, a pretty relevant distinction. And because Eskimo is a polysynthetic language, of course, you're going to see these roots in multiple derivations, multiple word formations, but that doesn't mean that Eskimo has um, this winter wonderland of words for snow, it just has two roots which engage in different root formations. And so he concludes by saying that stating that Eskimo has only two words for snow will not make you the most popular person in the room. It will have an effect roughly comparable to pouring 50 gallons of thick oatmeal into a harpsichord during a Baroque recital. But it will strike a blow for truth, responsibility, and standards of evidence and linguistics. So I really like this last piece about standards of evidence and linguistics, something that we want to keep in mind as we look at exotic languages. So I want to move away from snow to the sun and talk a little bit about noun classification in minoritized languages. I will start with a very brief overview of what the noun class or gender means. Then we're gonna look at a case in Australia and then I'll move on to my conclusions. So um, the concept of gender or a noun class is something that's familiar to anyone who has studied French or German or Russian. Um, and the idea is that many languages classify nouns by virtue of assigning them to one of several groups. And we know these groups as grammatical genders in the European tradition or as noun classes in a broader grammatical tradition. Typically, noun class is understood to be a broader term than grammatical gender. I will be using the word noun, words noun class today, but um, you can always replace them with grammatical gender if you feel more comfortable with that. So how do we know that nouns are divided into classes in a given language? We know that by what Charles Hockett called the behavior of associated words. And that means that uh, verbs, modifiers, determiners agree with a given noun in a noun class. Or if you uh, refer to this noun by a pronoun, the pronoun will also vary depending on the noun class of the noun. So it will be something like he, she, it, but it will be very systematic. And a simple illustration comes from French where we can have two containers, a suitcase or a purse. And depending on whether it's a suitcase or a purse, the determiner and the um, modifying adjective will be either feminine as the case with the suitcase, une valise blanche, or um, masculine, if we're talking about the purse, en sac blanc, a white purse. So you can see two white objects, both are used to carry things, completely arbitrary. There's nothing about the suitcase that makes it feminine. There's nothing about the purse that makes it masculine. And in fact, I chose those examples because in Russian, uh, there are a lot of Russian speakers here, the genders of these nouns will be just the opposite. The suitcase is going to be masculine and the purse is going to be feminine. So noun classes are different from classifiers, and this is where we can um, connect with some of the discussion in Andrew's book. A classifier is a term that designates countable objects or measurable quantities of a referent. So in English, we will say three heads of cabbage, but not three cabbages, five cups of water, but not five waters, unless we use some special context. So we use words cups and heads to quantify cabbage and water. And there are a number of distinctions that separate noun classes or genders from classifiers. Uh, the important one is that the same noun may appear in different groups in a classifier language. I'll, go, I'll show you an example in a moment. But the noun class is a noun class is a noun class in all contexts. Uh, a noun has a gender or noun class pretty much everywhere, whereas classifiers are only used in certain contexts, for example, in counting. Classifiers do not show up in agreement. Noun classes do. That's really important. That's this behavior of associated words. And then finally, if we look at the number of distinctions, we typically find fewer distinctions in noun class languages than we do in classifier languages. So here's an illustration from a Mayan language called Hull, where we see that the same word rope, which you may recognize because we have the word lasso, uh, Rope can be counted either using the classifier shock, which is cylinder, or the classifier bitch, which is a small round item. And 
The difference will be that you're quantifying two loops of rope versus two coils of rope. And we're going to talk a little more about classifiers, so I want you to keep them in your working memory. When we look at noun classes as a category, there are two main questions that linguists or language scientists ask. One is how exactly does a language divide its noun into classes? That's assignment. And the other question is how does the noun class feature of a particular noun gets copied into associate words? How does agreement work? So today I'm only going to talk about noun class assignment and uh, the question of division of nominals into classes connects very intimately and highly to the question of how a language learner, a child, acquires the knowledge of such classification. Now, I'm only going to talk about first language acquisition. We have all struggled with French or German genders, learning them as second languages, and um, you have all my sympathy, but that doesn't mean we're gonna talk about that. That's a different process. We're gonna talk about the child who has to learn French from zero, learn to German, learn Russian, and so on. So now we're gonna to move to noun classes in Australia. And we're gonna look at the language that you may have heard of. It's quite famous, it's called Dirbo. It's spoken in this part of Australia, in the um, Northern part in Queensland. Uh, and uh, in this very tiny area of Queensland, which you see on the map here, uh, in 2016, there were eight speakers of this language. So clearly it's not just minoritized, it's on the verge of extinction. I think that these speakers are quite old. A lot of work on Dirbo goes back to Bob Dixon's work in the 1960s. And that culminated in the book, you should, which you see on this slide, the Dirbo language of North Queensland, which made quite a splash because everything about this language was as exotic as it gets. So Dirbal has four noun classes, which manifest in agreement with the demonstrative. Dixon calls it the noun marker. And some other categories that Dirbal has are uh, cases. Uh, it's ergative. So back to Johnson's lecture, it's one of the ergative languages. And it also has a three-way distinction in dikes. So you can have things like proximal this, medial that, and distal, the one that you don't see, which we can translate as yonder. So here are some examples of um, here are some examples of noun class agreement on demonstratives. So you can see four different cases, and what's important is that for each case you have four different classes. So you have bai for class one, balan for class two, balam for class three, and balak for class four. And we're going to see these absolute determiners quite a bit in my next set of slides. So just, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to familiarize yourself with them, but that's essentially like uh, the French une and en, or the uh, Spanish el and la, um, similar to those determin the determiners. So th these are the concepts that we find across these classes. So class one, class two, class three, and class four. I'm gonna start with class three because that's the simplest one. It's basically anything you can eat, which is not meat. So all trees with edible fruit. So the question is, where does the stuff that I can eat, which is meat, go? And that goes into class one and class two. So class one includes man, kangaroos, possums, bats, most snakes, most fishes, some birds, most insects, moons, storms, rainbow, boomerang, some spares. Class two is women. Bandicoots, dog, platypus, some snakes, some fishes, most birds, um, firefly, scorpio, crickets, um, the caterpillar called hairy mare grub, anything that's connected with fire and water, sun and stars, shields, some spares, some trees. So you can see that there is a lot of overlap in concepts between classes one and two. And if we go to part to class four, you see that there is also um, some overlap their body parts, there's meat, bees and honey, wind, yam sticks, some spares, just like we saw in class two, most trees, grass, mud, stones, most noises and language. So a very, very complex system. And uh, the system has called, um, has attracted attention from a number of researchers. The most famous one was George Lakoff, who wrote this beautiful book, um, in 1987, Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things. And when he was making rounds and talking about this book, 
he emphasized that it shouldn't be called women, fire, and other dangerous things. So this is a disjunction, women, fire, and dangerous things. But so the idea behind Dixon's work, which then Lakoff took over and some other researchers is that we should account for the noun class composition in Dearborn in terms of prototypes. So there is a prototype and then there are some other concepts which are connected to this prototype via some associations and therefore they will be included in the relevant classes. So class one has the prototype of benign power or uh, maybe human masculinity. Class two has the prototype of malign power and for other researchers it's femininity. Class three is edible plants. The prototype is non-flesh food and that one was easy. And class four is everything else. So um, what we see here is this representation of what's known as radial categories. Mm, cognitive scientists love those. And the idea is that core semantics concepts represent the default conditions. And then you need a bunch of rules which allow for more fine grain network, which is based on more specific conditions. So prototype is defined by a variety of features, but those features may or may not be sufficient. And then you have a bunch of conventions which are formulated as rules that allow you to connect items to each other. So I'm just going to give you one rule of uh, Dearball radial categories proposed by Dixon and then taken up by Lakoff, and that's the myth or belief rule. And the idea is that if a noun has a certain characteristic um, on which, on, on the basis of which you can assign it to a class, but through a belief it's associated with a different characteristic, characteristic B, then characteristic B will take over and the noun will go to class B, not to class A. And here's an example, most birds are in class two because they are thought to be spirits of dead women. However, willy wagtails, so this is a picture of a willy wagtail, I have to look it up. So these are birds, they should be in class two, but instead they're in class one because they're believed to be mythical men. And so here's a representation of durable nouns where you have those radial categories. So class one, the center, the prototype is either a benign power or male, and there are a bunch of things associated with it. Class two, malign power or female, and then a bunch of things which are associated either directly or indirectly to the core. Um, the uh, third class is non-flesh food. So here you have a very simple association. And, <clears throat> excuse me, class four is what we will call default, everything else, things which you couldn't put in classes one, two, or three. And so just to show how links to the core work, uh, the sun is considered a female deity. It's married to the moon. Moon is in class one. Women are related to the sun by mythology. Birds are spirits of dead women. So again, they go to class two. This thing of the grub hits like sunburn. So it's linked to the sun. All items related to fire are also linked to the sun. The firefly is linked to fire, therefore linked to the sun. Stars and light are associated with fire and through that associated with the sun. Fire is dangerous. And so other dangerous things should also be in the same class. And therefore you get water and fighting in the same class. So here's uh, a point we want to consider as we look at this, and that is that children who learn a language with noun class for genders learn the bulk of gender assignment very early. Here is some data from better studied languages. Evidence is based both on production and comprehension. And if you look at the evidence, you basically see that by age two, when they are not toilet trained and cannot tie their shoes and don't have theory of mind, they know their genders. So French, Spanish, Dutch, German, Russian, and uh, there may be more work. Um, so we see that children learn the bulk of gender assignment early. And we also know through a lot of cognitive work that children map words to objects, actions, and events, not through association with other concepts, but directly referentially. And so again, there is quite a bit of work on uh, early categorization and early cognition, which indicates that the referential acquisition is particularly important for children. So that creates a dilemma for us. We know that children learn the bulk of gender assignment early. 
Uh, and we know that children map words to objects, actions, and events referentially. But then we have this very complicated radial category system, which are structured by association and convention. And so we don't have a good explanation as to how young children will acquire them. And so if Dearbell learners took forever to acquire noun classification, that would make Dearbell radically different from other languages with noun class. We might want to say that Dearbell doesn't have a noun class, it has something else. So what can we do? We can essentially have three ways to go. One, we could abandon the existing accounts of noun class assignment. We can claim that Dearbell does not have noun classes and has something instead. And then of course the onus is to explain what it is and to account for the agreement which we saw when I showed you different demonstratives. Or we can abandon the radial category analysis of Dearbell noun classes. Uh, and kind of a hint that this latter approach might be actually fruitful is in a very important paper by Keith Allen on classifiers, where he says, unless the kind of culture bound explanation of noun class composition that Dixon gives for Dearborn can be extended to other languages, one can speak only of a semantic bias in Australian noun classes, not honestly of a semantic basis. So we're back to the question about um, the way languages divide their nouns into classes and the way a language learner acquires the knowledge of noun classifications. A very common approach states that noun classifications are based on a small number of semantic features. They're often referred to as semantic core. And with the semantic core at the center, other nouns are drawn into the relevant class by surface analogy, by the way they look. And the common core features, semantic features, include things like mobility. Children are very early in recognizing uh, things which move and which do not move. Related to that is animacy, uh, birth gender, and uh, an important thing, can I eat that? That's something that's connected to survival. And of course, a child very early on learns whether or not she can put something in her mouth or not. <clears throat> And so uh, just to show you the power of surface analogy, I want to give you an example from the work by Luann Gerken and her colleagues where they took English speaking babies, 17 months old. Um, so they are not even verbal, many of them who don't speak any Russian. And they had a two minute exposure to a Russian gender paradigm. <clears throat> so what they did, they had the babies listen to some feminine nouns and some masculine nouns. Uh, the feminine nouns were in the instrumental and in the accusative, and the masculine nouns were in the genitive and in the instrumental. Uh, and then uh, where you see the red uh, cells in the table, they gave them correct and wrong forms of those nouns. And after two minutes of exposure, the babies were actually able to distinguish grammatical Russian words, which they had never heard before from ungrammatical ones. This indicates that surface analogy for young children is a very powerful mechanism. And there are many other examples. I just chose this one because it's so dramatic. So we, we now take all these considerations back to Dirbal. Let's ask two questions. Where did Dirbal noun classes come from? And how are these noun classes assigned? So if we look at the origins of Dirbal noun classes, we find that genetically related languages in Australia actually do not have noun classes. They have classifiers. You might remember the chart I had in the beginning. And Dirbal still has some evidence of the original classifier system. And we also see that the noun class system in Dirbal is a relatively recent development that's confirmed by a very rare use of noun class markers, demonstratives in traditional Dirbal songs collected by Dixon and his colleagues. We know that independently, we know that noun class systems can actually develop from classifiers when uh, classifier groups merge into a smaller number of genders. Uh, and generic nouns such as woman, man, animal serve as class core. That has been shown for a number of languages and uh, Grev Corbett in his book on gender has quite a few examples. So what we have is probably the development that I show you here where male and edible animates 
were merged into class one, and then classifiers, female bird, fire, liquid, stinging, inedible animates, they were all merged into class two. Edible non-animates became the core of class three, and all other classifiers merged into one class, class four. And as a result, you have those four classes. So what you have is a new system, which is very similar to what we know from very familiar languages, where the semantic core is animacy and mobility, biological gender, and digestibility. Can you eat this? And so if all these features are not specified, then properties, um, surface properties, formal properties of a noun determinants class. Now, indirable stress is always on the initial syllable. It's sort of anti-French. And uh, so the, so, uh, the stressed syllables initial segments are very visible because um, they are in the stress, they're prominent. Uh, so that might determine how a noun is drawn into a particular class. Uh, there is also an, an, a number of nouns ending in gun, uh, which is homophonous with the suffix gun, um, which creates femin uh, feminine nouns, sort of like s or is in familiar languages. And then finally, there are a bunch of words which may be just homophonous with nouns that belong to semantic core, and then they end up in the same class. So for example, the word for man, yara, and the word for fishing line, yara or yara, uh, they end up in the same class because they just look the same. So if you add some of these formal features, you end up with a very simple decision tree, which I show you here. First you ask, is there a semantic label? And if the answer is yes, if it's male or female or edible, you know which class this goes to. If there is no male, female or edible, you ask the next question, is this animate? And if the answer is yes, you have to ask whether or not there are some formal features. And what you can see in this chart is a bunch of stressed initials, B, Google, Ma, Yi, and then the suffix gun or the ending gun I talked about. And then if none of those apply, then you go to either class one or class four if this is inanimate. So a fairly simple uh, decision tree one, which you can build from pretty much any language. And I'm sure that people are sitting there thinking about French or German. In fact, you can build similar decision trees for French and German with a lot of formal features there. So each language has its own exception. So in French, of course, the famous word is la sentinelle which is feminine, but it means a watchman and traditionally watchmen were male. Um, in German, the word for girl is uh, neuter, but doesn't deny that this is a living being and a female. Uh, the famous Russian word porfe is supposed to be neuter and every Russian grammar says make it neuter. So in Dearbull, there is its own sentinel, the word for wallaby, bargan, uh, which should be class two because it ends in gone, but it remains in class one. So in a way it's an exception similar to what we see in the more familiar examples I have here. And so the bottom line is that each grammatical category has a small number of irregular forms, which either survive because they're very common or they get reanalyzed like the Russian word coffee, which is um, becoming more and more neutral. So if we go back to the possibilities that I listed, what to do, we can abandon the existing count of non-class assignment. We could say that Dearbo does not have non-classes or we could abandon the radial category analysis. It looks like we don't have to abandon the existing accounts of non-class assignment. We don't have to abandon the claim that Dearbo has non-classes and therefore has agreement. So what we have to do is we just have to give up the radial category analysis because we've looked at more ecologically valid data, not just concepts, but the words which encode those concepts. So there's another book about Dearbell, which um, was written by Dixon's student, Annette Schmidt, and that uh, worked with the young, what she called young speakers, Dearbell, or young people's Dearbell. These were children and grandchildren of Dixon's consultants. And she found two groups of speakers, the more fluent ones who spoke more traditional Dearbell, and the less proficient speakers, um, which she called young people, dear speakers. And she wrote a whole book about those less proficient speakers, a clear example of heritage dear speakers. And so if you look at noun classes in this heritage variety, young people's dear you can see that they went from four noun classes to three. And the division is extremely simple. 
uh, first question you ask, is this animate? If the answer is no, you put it in class four, everything is inanimate. If it's animate, is it male or female? You get classes one and two. So an obvious question is what happens to edibles? Edibles are inanimate, and so they're now in class four. So you have a very, very simple system, which no longer actually relies on the shape of the words, just relies on extremely simple um, concepts of animacy and biological gender, again, available to a very young child. So Dibble is not that exotic. It has a simple semantic core, the same that we see recurrent across the world languages. And all the features we found are the features that children are sensitive to early on, like natural gender and animacy. There are several smaller categories like edibility, but they do not require any abstract connection or cultural knowledge uh, because this is something that a young child won't be uh, able to access. And there are a bunch of highly salient formal features, which are again accessible to young learners, such as stressed initial syllables or the salient ending gun, which we saw. So what we see is that the inclusion of women and fighting fire and water in the same class is based on surface similarity of salient feature and is supported by diachronic evidence. And so uh, what we want to uh, think about this, whether or not the data are actually ecologically valid. And here the conclusions are not as cheerful because Dirbal was endangered even at the time when Dixon worked mm, with the language speakers in the 1960s. We only have about 600 nouns available through grammar and texts. And so all the formal generalizations I offered here are of course tentative. But it's pleasing that our state of knowledge and our understanding of noun categorization actually allows us to reanalyze the data in a more predictive way. It's too late to do something experimental for Dirbal, but um, here is an example of experimental work that Eni Gagliardi did. Uh, she went to Dagestan, where noun classifications are in, in, a, in a way similar to Dirbal ones. And she ran a series of behavioral experiments with children and adults who were asked to classify real and nonce words by noun class. Uh, she particularly worked on the language I've worked on quite a bit, says, or Dido. It's a minoritized language in the Northeast Caucasus. And she found that children and adults only use certain types of semantic information. Again, just the core things, mobility, animacy, uh, biological gender. And then children in her study were found to use reliable phonological cues over the even reliable semantic cues. So whenever there was a conflict between, let's say the noun starting with a particular sound and meaning a mobile entity, the child went with the formal, the surface analogy. So that again, reifies this conception I brought up earlier that children are very interested and very attuned to um, reliable formal cues, surface cues. And so if we go back to Pullum's um, quote, um, saying that Dirbal does not equate women with dangerous things will not make you the most popular person in the room, but will strike a blow for truth, responsibility, and standards of evidence and linguistics. So what we've done is we've made exotic much less exotic. Um, so if we now sort of try to wrap it up, um, one of the question is how speakers decide which noun goes into which class. And I wanna emphasize that this question may be different for child learners and adult learners. And if you look more closely at Gagliardi's work, she actually found important differences between children and adults, one of which I mentioned, and that is that children overemphasize the surface analogy. And this is where children often make mistakes in noun class assignment until they go to school or get enough input. But generally, even if we separate children and adults, we see that linguistic analysis, where we pay attention both to form and meaning, can provide answers to this question, even for languages that are less studied, that are severely endangered, where we don't have enough data. So what we need is more detailed work on noun classifications in individual minoritized languages. I've given you just one example. Uh, my colleagues and I have done work on uh, noun categorization in the Caucasus, but we certainly need to look at more minoritized languages in that regard. And we also need acquisition and experimental work on noun classifications in minoritized languages. 
So <laughs> the bottom line is that we can actually turn what seemed exotic into very much understandable material. And I think that this, um, this is something that the entire linguistic community has to keep in mind. We are responsible for representing data from minoritized languages accurately and respectfully. And we're also uh, responsible for analytical rigor in approaching minoritized languages. We want to use the theory that we have to serve these languages, we want to use these languages to enrich our theories, and we want to avoid exoticizing these languages without reason. So thank you very much. Uh, I should probably stop sharing and um, pass it on to Andrew. Thank you, Masha. That was a fantastic lecture, and I think a fantastic um, not only tour of how it is that some of these gender systems work and how gender systems are really at this crossroads between formal and phonological and semantic features, but also a very good broader lesson, as you say, in the respectful uh, use and respectful integration of data from minoritized languages into, into linguistic theory. So I'm sure we have a lot of questions, and I'm eager to see what our audience I ask, of course, questions may be uh, of a psycholinguistic nature, of an anthropological nature, of a broader social nature. Let's open up the floor. I don't see any questions, actually. Oh, um, there's a... Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, hello, thank you for the wonderful lecture. It was really interesting to hear all of that and especially about your, well, partially about your experience in uh, field linguistics. Uh, the question is not like directly related to the topic, but I'm really curious. Uh, when you were talking about that research done on uh, uh, small children processing genders in Russian. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how did they judge if the children, the child was able to uh, realize that the noun is not grammatically correct? Right, so, because right. like 17 months, it's they're really not, they're, Many of them are nonverbal. You're right. That's a very good question. So there are a bunch of techniques that researchers use, and uh, your question actually goes broader than the question about the Gherkin study, which I cited. Um, how do we know, for example, that children at four months know the difference between a bird and an airplane? Uh, and there are two main um, uh, methods that people use. One is called preferential looking. So a child sits on someone's lap, and then they see uh, something on the right, something on the left, and they measure the reaction by how soon and how quickly the child turns in a certain direction and whether or not they are bored or not. So that's one, that's kind of the whole paradigm is called preferential looking. The other one is uh, the degree um, of intensity with which one they with which they suck on the pacifier. There is a pacifier that they have and this pacifier is connected to a machine. And if a child is uh, experiencing something new, the sucking rate actually increases. And so this is another way of doing that. So these are the two main ones. Uh, lately, people have been using um, eye tracking. Um, again, they uh, just see where the child moves their eyes and how long they look. And another one is papillometry where they see how quickly their pupils um, dilate. Um, and so all of these can be measured as responses in nonverbal populations, especially young children. Um, so I hope that this helps, but um, if you wanna read about preferential looking, I can certainly send some references to John and he can yes, post them. It would be really helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tatiana. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I have maybe a philosophical question, but why do you think we need those categories? Is it just the human desire to categorize things into neat boxes? Why do these uh, noun classes develop in the first place? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't have an answer. If anyone does, uh, please speak up. We don't have, uh, I think the human desire, or the cognitive um, predisposition to divide things 
us, but in a way, we're not saying why we do that. We just say, well, humans like to divide things into categories, but what stands behind that, um, well, which part of cognition may be responsible and that I don't know. Uh, we don't, but a more narrow question for language scientists is the question of why languages actually need gender. And one would expect, for example, that languages with gender agreement will allow for faster lexical access than languages without gender agreement. So a Russian um, or French speaker will have faster time getting the word door than an English speaker, but we don't find any of that evidence in processing work. So it's kind of interesting that we don't see any experimental evidence for the um, uh, for the uh, utility of gender agreement in uh, language processing. So that's what I find fascinating. But I guess um, the long the short answer is we don't know, and it's certainly something that deserves to be discussed. Very important question. I mean, there are, I think what Masha's answer also reveals is sometimes there is a tendency to sometimes think of perhaps, you know, perhaps functionalist approaches, you know, it's a tendency that, for example, languages with vowel harmony don't have gender and vice versa. And so then you might think, you know, perhaps they, perhaps gender is used as a kind of segmentation cue, a parsing cue to know where one phrase starts and the other one begins because you're going to have coherence and that's a nice idea but actually in practice it's quite difficult to show that that that's being used that that's being the case that that's causally deterministic so it's it's an excellent question it's philosophical but it's 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 very important ed i believe has the next question uh, thank you uh that was an excellent presentation i learned so much and it's uh it's really great that somebody like touches on the topic of exotization of these languages um, and um, so my next question was like, what other kinds of exotization could like you start to narrow down? Like, where can we spread out from here? For example, um, in the term of verb classifiers, for example, I learned in an endangered languages class that uh, um, Navajo, other Diné languages have different verbs for give when it turns mm -hmm. out it's like a root and then a verb classifier, you know? Um, uh, this compositionality, of course, is very productive, but um, um, so, um, how do you see um, all these, like, like I guess in like pop linguistics too, like having different words for this different, um, where can we, what are the applications of like noun classifications in regards to like, you know, other types of like things like verb classification, um, whether it could also be just an incorporated element as well. Um, what are your thoughts on over exoticizing in other lexico-semantic fields? Well, I think you brought up something really important, and that is that uh, we know from sign languages and from um, uh, some Native American languages that um, verb classifications are actually finite and fairly, um, fairly tame compositional. And again, I think when we look at things which look exotic, to me, a very important um, set of guidelines is to look for acquisition. So if this is very abstract, if this is extremely complicated, then that might be literature rather than linguistics. But then, you know, if a child cannot learn at like normal age two to, two to four, uh, then we might be doing something wrong. So that's something that I would use as a rule of thumb. But there's another dimension I wanna bring up and that is that when we look at minoritized languages, as Andrew mentioned already, they are often the product of unbalanced bilingualism. So people don't use them as much. So what you have is shrinking input, shrinking exposure. Uh, and because the speaker doesn't have all the data that say a baseline speaker does with the language developing and the normal amount of hours, we might end up um, having less data, which then human mind reanalyzes a certain way. And so I think an important part of a research agenda working on minoritized languages is to look for properties which define them structurally in a certain way. And so I'm gonna give you two examples because I think we haven't really done our homework in that department. So one is that um, these languages actually do not um, use too much of embeddings. 
So you see a lot of coordination and not as much subordination. So in languages with head final structures, there are often a lot of converbs. And in dangers of minoritized languages of this sort are often um, described as losing converbs. And that might be a part of a more general system where the um, complex embedding structures are just not fully acquired. And therefore, the speaker reanalyzes them as a set of finite structures. Uh, and another one is um, the limited number of null elements. So um, unbalanced bilinguals generally do not like silence. So you often lose ellipsis. Uh, you have more limited gapping structures. And so the loss of null elements and their particular shrinkage is another area which I see in um, so-called heritage languages. And it's something that's often commented on in endangered languages. So I've only given you two examples because I don't have any more, but hopefully as we start looking at this whole area, we start identifying properties which are due to unbalanced bilingualism, which in turn come from limited input. We might say more. Thank you so much. Those are excellent examples. Okay. Oh, um, so we may I, have time one or two more questions. Oh, yeah, someone's uh, Vinny. Yeah, I actually noticed a, um, a comment from the Facebook page that I can cool. post into here really quick. Oh, I'm not on Facebook, so I, I'm not on the monitoring. That's great. Yeah, the, this is from the uh, live stream here. Cool. You are now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you're on it, but you're not on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I could read it, or Andrew, if you want to take it, I no preference really. Sure. I missed most of the talk, this person says, sorry, but I was wondering whether there are experiments looking at a possible preference for meaning or phonological form informing the classes. You know, could you, could, could you see biases, I guess, in uh, rapid formation, whether children have preferences for, have preferences for categorizations that are consistently semantic or preferences for categorizations that are consistently phonological, or if in fact they're happy to mix information and forming categories? Good question. So the, the, um, I did talk about um, Annie Galliardi's work on CES, where she found that children certainly went for surface form over meaning. Uh, and then if you're interested in more, in less exotic languages, there is a really wonderful book, an old book by Annette Carmelov smith about gender in French. Uh, what Annette did, um, she took French speaking children from ages four to ages 10, uh, pretty grown up kids by modern standards of um, acquisition experimental work. And she gave them pictures of Martians where uh, the pictures looked white, vaguely male, female, but they were not pictures of humans. They were pictures of aliens, she called them Martians. Uh, and the names of these, um, Human, human beings or alien, whatever you want to call them, uh, totally mismatched with the biological gender that the child could surmise. So they had some biological properties which looked more like females and more like males. And then the name was the opposite. So younger children invariably went with the form. So if the name was masculine, even if the picture looked feminine, they would classify it as uh, male. Starting with age seven, the children started paying more attention to what the pictures looked like, and uh, they often would override the semantics. And so this is very consistent with Galliardi's work, where she found that adults were able to overlook some uh, surface analogy in favor of a strong semantic core or strong semantic feature, but young children did not. So what we see is something that recurs from culture to culture, where we find that young children are much more sensitive to surface knowledge. Another, um, a bunch of uh, uh, citations in one of my slides, where I talk about the work on uh, French and Dutch, which was also experimental and they looked at fairly young children. Again, we see evidence for surface analogy. So I hope this answers the question. Great. Yeah. I mean, maybe the person in the void can tell us, but I think, you know, for every question one has, there are at least 10 other people with probably the same question. So hopefully those other nine people have had their question answered. Okay. 
Wonderful. Well, um, yeah, I think, you know, you can see that in a way this, this, this shows how evidence from typology, from uh, experiments and from acquisition and language change all go together in this, in this, in this complex puzzle of how genders change over time. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We I'll have one you. maybe we'll question, time for one last question from our longtime uh, NYI enthusiast Tayeba. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. It's really nice to see all of you again. Uh, thank you, Mar Maria, for your very interesting and insightful talk. I have one question. I'm curious about the, why uh, some morphosyntactic or morphosemantic features, whatever we can call them, can take part in shifting but others not. I mean, um, I'm comparing person with gender, more mm -hmm. specifically. Why this right. is the case? Well, that's a great question. And I think um, the answer, um, go, the question goes to my colleague, Omar Preminger, who's also here. Because, you know, Omar talks a lot about the um, importance of probing for person in his work. Um, so they, yeah. um, and also, you know, I want to, <clears throat> uh take you back to mark baker's work where he talks about how mm. person and um gender are different because gender is only category that is reflected a certain person is never reflected in um modifier agreements so there is a, there are some fundamental grammatical differences between the features <laughs> person and gender uh on the more cognitive level person is very easy to define because it's very deictic and it's very robust. So we can always see in a conversation who is the participant, who is the author, and then third person is basically the absence of those features. Uh, for gender, as we see, there are way more ways of classifying things. They're not didactically defined. And so this absence of didactic features and didactic reference makes gender harder to access. And what we see in grammar is a very complex reflection of those uh, fundamental cognitive differences. Right. Right. And so is that true to assume that uh, person can be considered as uh, an element which is some sort of, you know, more prototypical than other features or? I don't know what, what you mean by prototype. So I kind of um, took some time in this talk to actually um, get rid of the concept of prototype. But um, mm -hmm. what I would say is that person is a more stable grammatical wow. feature or, um, across time um, than, for example, gender. Uh, and that could be, again, due to this didactic feature. So it's kind of interesting to look, in that regard, to look at um, creoles. Uh, creoles are generally defined as languages that don't have agreement. But um, there are, there's actually a simplification. There are a couple of creoles, um, Tokpisan and, and Bislama in the Pacific, and uh, some varieties of um, Saramakan in the Caribbean, uh, where first, uh, agreements start to develop. And in these cases, you always start with agreement with the per with person. It's always agreement with the participant. So it's kind of the opposite of English, where we have agreement with third person. So it's always agreement with first and second, and then third person is not defined. So I think, again, back to this mm -hmm. kind of cognitive salience of person, that might explain why it's more resilient grammatically and um, recurs in the diachrony of language change. Thank you. Thanks for your explanations. Okay. Let's thank Masha once more. This is really nice, wonderful um, element of this broader discussion in the series. So you can clap auditorily, visually, iconically, however you wish. And, thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Masha, for taking the time to participate and to dialogue with, of course, these elements in our um, series. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow at uh, 1.30 p.m. Uh, New York time. Uh, be there or be a right angle rhombus. Thank you. Bye. Um, I just have actually a super small question. Is there any way we could get um, access to the slides? Because I uh, think sure, I'll, I okay. can send them to you. Oh, okay, great. And then we can post them on the website for anyone who sure. had trouble viewing them today. So, okay. yeah, great. Sounds good. Thank right. you so Thanks. much. Appreciate it. All right. See you guys all. Take care. <laughs>